There was that lady and then after her you and then you Namaskar. Namaskar, Nina. Um, so, we asked the question. Yes. Then the impulse, action, joyfulness. Is there an instance ever where it's impulse, action, and then pain? I have to interrupt you for a second. I think you have forgotten the most important word in your description. Okay, surrender, mm. question, action, joy. So why did you forget it? Um. Well, I'm saying it now, so... Because it's in, that's the whole thing. No? But let's say, let's say, take the example of Christ. Yes. So, he was in a state of surrender, I'm assuming. He was loving action. He found himself in a situation which he obviously found painful, otherwise he wouldn't have said, may this fate be taken away from me. So, is it always joy that comes from responding to the impulse or can it sometimes be something that you would rather not experience because there is another way of growing and that's through pain because there's a lot of people thinking through challenge through pain through suffering there is growth the idea that pain can lead to anything which is actually conducive to deeper self-knowledge is a falsehood. It's the ego that says that because it wants to impose the pain and be allowed to do so. So if you look at the man on the cross, he is on that cross not because he was in surrender to the truth, but because there was a moment when the ego came into play, else he wouldn't be on the cross. Because that kind of physical pain is not something the truth would impulse a body into. So that, that part of his story is, one can say, the story of an enlightened being who had to re-enter into the system and deal with the falsehood around him in the world, with the ego around him. And because he had been in those enlightened states, was not present enough completely in the system in order to actually deal with what was happening around in a way that would not have led to he himself being attacked crucified. If in the 5th century they took the image of Christ on the cross as the leading symbolism of, of the Christian movements, that is because it suited greedy capital's idea of imposing its subjugation on mainly the men so that they would bend to the idea that suffering is what leads them to greater heights, including the suffering of having to serve that greedy capital in the conquests all around the world. We are talking here about very simple things. The truth will not impulse this body into action which leads to this body having to undergo pain of that kind. 
because it's counterproductive to the experience of life itself. You cannot actually experience the joy of this living if you're nailed on a cross, you can't. So the idea of suffering leading to greater heights of self-knowledge may have some, some minor applications here and there, but fundamentally it is an idea of falsehood. It is an ego that is bringing this idea in order to perpetuate itself. So pain, if there is pain, that means the action has not come from the soul, from the impulse. Okay, can I just add to that? So let's say my soul is impulsing me toward an action which potentially could bring me great joy, or which would, yeah, okay. But then I'm dealing with somebody who, do you, you see what I'm saying? Somebody who may not be connected or even their soul is telling them to do something which would not match mine. Could that work? Could that happen? Could they intercept it? When a human being is moving into states of surrender and tuning into the master and operating from that impulse and is vigilant about when the ego is trying to take over, increasingly the, the environment turns into one of joy. There is no argument against that's how it is, it's dogmatically so. When you are tuning in deeper and deeper and deeper in surrender, the master of your being, the soul, the antar atman, the antar guru will impulse this entire system into truth actions and these truth actions will lead to joy. So if there is someone whose actions don't gel with your actions, they will actually move out of the environment and there will be others taking over where that tuning in is happening increasingly. Mm -hmm. And that is... it happens. It's like this unfolding matrix of perfection with all its associations into which you tune in. The more you're in surrender, the more you're in that perfection unfolding. The more you go with the ego, the more you're out of that perfection. It's either this or it's that. So, another person cannot come and block you from connecting with your soul. That is your decision, you have to take on the responsibility. You cannot blame the other person or the government or your parents or... It is you, Nena, who takes that responsibility. And take on the sadhana, the tapas, the practice of tuning in to the antar atman. And as you deepen that practice, you don't, you don't actually have to do much more than that because your environment will gradually become more and more joyous. If, on the other hand, you start to detach from everything and identify with soul and say, I am that and so, all of this is not me, what you will find out is that the transformations haven't happened. So, at one moment when you suddenly fall from that conceptual edifice, that entire thing will just attack you because it has not receded, it is very much still there. Which is why the surrender is what... That's the magic word, that's the magic word. It's surrender, Nina, surrender. It's bending down. It's not about conceptually, you know, describing the processes. Even just bending down, I mean, how much of bending down does one even do in a life, you know? And bending down means the, your, your eye is focused on, on the master. I am your instrument, I am your instrument. Let this instrument function from this impulse of the truth. And you're not spaced out in some moon suit, you're present, your eyes are open, you're, you're, you're tuning in to a, to a master that you have known already as a child. It is reconnecting 
to the signal and circumventing the noise, that's what it is. But surrender is the thing, that's the key. What will happen after that, you'll find out when you move into that surrender state. Again and again and now and now and now and now. Now, this moment. So it grows, it has to. But it is through the practice that the knowledge of what will happen emerges. And it, it emerges with everyone. It's not a state of exaltation and, phew, finally I'm free. No, because it's not about freedom. It's about surrender. When you are in surrender, you don't need to be free. There is no need for freedom, imagine. That whole idea of being free of all of this simply dissipates because you are in surrender. So why do you need to be free? Free, free from what? That promise of freedom from all of this which is, which is the carrot that is dangled in the Neo-Advaitin practices is a very, very limited amount of time that that experience is there and then it just falls back. And a lot of the time people spend years trying to recover that initial exaltation or experience of, of this separatedness from everything rather than an embracing of thisness and moving into surrender. So it's also something to really, you know... So all experience will be positive each time we follow the impulse what happens is that your system will have to learn to interpret what's happening because, you know, it's very... This is a satsang, it's not a wellness seminar. It's a satsang of seekers who are very keen on knowing the truth of their existence. It is a satsang, a group of those actually in truth, then it is the truth that we have to connect with. When we connect with the truth and the actions that emerge from that truth lead to circumstances which our system is not yet ready to interpret, we may initially interpret it as difficulties. But the joy grows because when you fearlessly go with the, with the impulse of the truth, there is like a foundation of joy created which you may initially not even understand because you've lived from ego a large part of your life. You don't even know what joy is. I'm not saying you personally now, but in general, systems that have been operating on ego for a large part of their life have to recalibrate to even grasp that it is possible to live in that kind of joy without detachment as the as the posture, but surrender as the posture. So yes, in the beginning you may not be sure, but it's not about positive and negative, it's simply about this system being more coherent, contoured and integrated into thisness. So if you have to make a decision and you're not sure, but you, you have, you, it would be a good thing to make a decision, is it best to sort of back off or just jump in and with both feet and hope it won't be too painful and hopefully it'll be good? I feel if the posture is surrender, it's not a, a one-day seminar where you get the tick-offs and then you go and apply them. It's a sadhana, it's a practice. Mm. And why I'm insisting on this is because only those that are ready to take up that practice will know. And there are many, many, many people around the world who have taken up this practice and are very, very clear that they start at one point to actually feel the impulse of the soul. So it is a practice and you have to take it up. And yes, when you take up this practice, at one point there'll be a clear impulse. 
And until that point arises, it's always this way or that way, which is anyway how you're living. Mm -hmm. So by taking up the practice, you at least give yourself a chance to tune into your master. Yeah, I only ask that because I've got a yoga course, it's yes, no, yes, no, tomorrow, which starts tomorrow. So I, uh, yeah. Take I'm it, thinking. take, quiet yourself down and even if you make a mistake, you've been living your life like that till now anyways. The only difference is now you know that there is a material instance within you that is able to impulse the system so you can start to practice listening to it. Even if you make a mistake, at least you know something now which you didn't know before. You just did not know this before and now you know it. So even if you get a wrong impulse and you have to go through pain because of that, you keep on trying, it's a sadhana, it's a practice and some people get it quite fast and some people take a while longer. It depends on your readiness to bend. Surrender means don't impose the ego on what the soul or the source is going to make you do, just let it impulse you. And don't be afraid. Even if you make a mistake, it's better to do it fearlessly than to do it with fear. Just be fearless, just do it. The worst that can happen, the absolute worst that can happen is you lose your life. And finally, just chill, relax, relax. Even if you make a mistake, go fearlessly, go. This life is meant to be lived fearlessly. And gradually what happens, you start to tune in more, you make a couple of mistakes again, again, and at one point, it's actually... Can it even be like that? You'll be so shocked to know that it's there. Be fearless, more than anything else. Fear is the ego, that's the, the enemy. Okay, thank you. After... Yes. Do one thing, Nena. Take a quiet spot somewhere at the river, sit down for a moment, quiet your thinking, just that you're there. Feel yourself in surrender. Take yourself through that process. Move into surrender, put a smile on that face. Move into surrender, feel, 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 feel. Quiet, 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 quiet. Quiet the thoughts and then just ask. And the first impulse you get, a yes or a no, just go with it fearlessly. And it'll be the thing to do.